And the big problem is the word scale. It's just the sheer scale of everything we're talking about, which I'm certain is not properly understood in the public domain. Now, if we've got, if I'm this, if I'm the head of this agency and I'm sitting here in 2050, looking back and we have a zero carbon, zero emissions economy for Ireland in 2050, there are three very large engineering projects which will have been completed. Ground transport will have been electrified. Heat, both uh, commercial and domestic, will have been electrified. And the electricity sector, that's the generation, the transmission, and the distribution of electricity, will have been expanded to allow the first two projects together. And it's these three major projects which will be the focus of my work today. I point out that um, these three projects are necessary but they are not sufficient for a net zero economy because I've not mentioned uh, agriculture or forestry, uh, air or sea transport, um, changes in people's lifestyles, either voluntarily or imposed, uh, extra costs associated with two transport fuel system infrastructures running in parallel, or indeed the cost of the electrical vehicles themselves. And furthermore, I will not have considered the siting of the new electricity generation uh, that will be required, but I will quantify how much it will cost. The, the, I have some underlying assumptions. I'm going to assume that we're aiming for a broadly similar economy in 2050, both quantitatively and qualitatively as today. That is, I'm not making some drastic societal assumptions in, in this work. That is something that be, could be followed up subsequently. And the reason I use today's figures, that is in terms of population growth and efficiency gains in energy over the next 30 years, they're both somewhere about 10% and cancel each other out as far as the energy sector is concerned. And then there'll be some other assumptions I make along the way, but they'll be cited as we go along. Now, this is the slide for which I would really like to get a hold of the um, raw data from Ireland. This is data from the United Kingdom, and it shows the use of energy in terms of electricity, heat, and transport over a period of four years from 2013 to 2017. Now, my question one on the right-hand side is, can I get the actual Irish data, either for the Republic of Ireland or the Island of Ireland? And it's the second question which I've raised and haven't done a detailed analysis. I think one difference between Ireland and the United Kingdom as a whole is the fact that there's a rather larger number of server farms uh, in uh, Ireland for major um, American uh, tech companies. And I haven't factored that in as a special exercise, but that is something that would have to be done further. Now, I want to draw some... Um, inferences from this particular graph. In fact, uh, it's getting this graph for um, New Zealand, and indeed I've done it also for the United States now. This graph is the one that underpins all the costings because of the following. Today, electricity, as you can see, is a base load and it's got a variable additional use. It peaks in winter and interesting enough in the United States, the electricity use peaks in summer. It's an average and a sinusoidal uh, <clears throat> peaking in winter and less in summer. But notice that the actual amplitude of the sinusoid for the uh, electricity, which is the reddish brown line, is not as high as the huge variation we have for uh, heating energy, which is something like five times as much, six times as much in the middle of winter as it is in the middle of summer. And that base load in summer for heat is probably industrial heat. Now, the other thing I want you to point out, is the first major point I want to make is that the transport use of energy is pretty constant during the year. And it's at a level, it's about twice the level of the electrical energy use. That gray step line running across is about twice as high as the um, electricity. Now here, you just have to concentrate for one minute. Internal combustion engines are typically about 30% efficient in the use of the energy in fossil fuels, where electric motors, 
are over 90% efficient in the use of electrical energy. So if we were to electrify all of ground transport, we would need a grid that's two thirds the size of the existing grid in Ireland to run that electricity, to electrify transport. The fact of two thirds comes from the fact that we use twice as much electricity uh, uh, at any time for, um, for uh, transport, but the, uh, the use of it is three times more efficient. Now, in taking this UK data, I'm just going to assume that the Irish data is the same, but is scaled by a factor of five on 66, which is the relative population of uh, Ireland and the um, United Kingdom. Now, <clears throat> a small fraction of, of the transport energy is actually air and sea transport. And that's likely to be remain based on kerosene and bunker fuels for the foreseeable future. Uh, I'll come back to that, I think, in a, if necessary. Um, the second thing I want to do is to look at the highly variable heat. If the heat was produced by dual heating, that is uh, the heat we need, we got from the equivalent of radiant uh, three bar heaters as of, as of old or an equivalent technology, we would need a grid three times the size of the existing grid just to be able to supply that heat in the middle of winter when there is a peak demand. But if we make universal use of heat pumps with a coefficient of performance about three, and that is optimistic for Ireland and the United Kingdom, heat pumps are, work at their best when they have very highly insulated homes, and that's why they work uh, well in Scandinavia, more so even than here. But if we have the universal use of the coefficient of performance of three, instead of having three times the grid, we'd need to have another grid equal in size to uh, just maintain the heating element of the Irish economy. So the results of this exercise so far is that is on the scale of the electrification process. If we're going to uh, electrify both ground transport and heat, we're going to need to expand the grid by a factor 1.7 times its already size. So the grid will go from one today to a size of 2.7 in 2050. And for Ireland, that's a figure of about seven gigawatts capacity going to 19 gigawatts in 2050. Is that all clear? Is there any major problems with that? I mean, of, of concept, but that's just giving you the sense of the scale. Now I can work the cost of that term. Uh, distribution. We need roughly to add 0.4 gigawatts of firm capacity each year for the next 30 years. And that's 10 times the average wind capacity investment in Ireland for the last 20 years. So you can see that if we are going to go down this electrification route, there's going to be have to be a step change in capacity and investment. Now, there's a second note I want to add, and that is that in your current house in Ireland, there'll be a 60 amp mains fuse. That's been a standard uh, for uh, decades. And it, when it was set, a nine amp kettle and a 13 amp uh, kitchen stove was the largest domestic appliance. And so the factor of 60 was there to uh, allow several items to be used in parallel. But in the new all electric home, if we have a ground source heat pump, when it starts up for the first minute or so, it's drawing 58 amps. A radiant hob, even today, a radiant hob, when all the uh, lights are glowing, is drawing 27 amps. A slow or fast electric charger draws 12 or 13 amps. And if you replace an, a current gas powered shower with an electric powered shower, you need 33 amps. So the all electric home is going to be using far more energy at certain times of the day, uh, far more current than the 60 amp fuse. So the distribution system, uh, most houses will have to have some re rewiring to cope with the mains fuse. And many of the local distributions of electricity in suburbs and cities is scaled and scoped by the fact that the maximum draw of a current from a typical house of 60 amps. And if that's going to go up, 
more, then uh, quite a lot of the uh, wiring and streets will have to be resized. And certainly all the local substations will have to be done. And there is a case in point uh, through my New Zealand connections, the local electricity distribution in Auckland, New Zealand is already at breaking point because of the major expansion of the city size over the last 30 years. And a woman rang, wrote in and asked for a fast electric charger at her home and was told no, that if there were three or more of those going at once in her street, uh, there would be a blowout and it would be a $20 million investment to put the strengthening electrical cable from uh, Remuera to, from Newmarket to Remuera, two suburbs of Auckland, and it wasn't budgeted for at this stage. Now, a detailed study of rewiring the UK uh, comes to a figure of 700 billion. And on the uh, pro ratering that I did, uh, and the reference to this is a man called Travis, and his um, paper is, in, is referred to in the last slide, and everybody is welcome to a copy of these slides um, through Jim O'Brien. So the Irish cost for rewiring the um, most parts of this, the country uh, 53, is 53 billion. Now it might be lower to the extent that you have a slightly higher ratio of people living in the countryside than in cities. This is mainly an urban problem, but it, um, uh, that's my starting figure. Now the current Irish transmission system can, so it's of 6,800 kilometers of high voltage uh, uh, transmission lines. And I'm going to assume that approximately double this in order to get the grid from one to um, 2.7 or three thereabouts, I'm gonna assume double. And there are figures in the United States of uh, how much uh, it costs uh, in um, pounds per million pounds per kilometers. I've done this from dollars to that, and I should really have done it for um, for um, into euros. But it's a 1.2 parity. But this gives you the scale, and there's a reference there to where you can get the details. And if you take that scale, that number and do a mix of uh, the various um, high voltages, you get to a figure of 15 to 20 billion, uh, 15 billion to do the re, uh, the, to add the extra um, transmission, and it probably goes up to 20 billion by the time you replace the controls, all the uh, transformers and various switching gear and everything else. So that's a figure for the, for the transmission. And then finally, there's the generation. Today, there's seven gigawatts installed capacity, and we need to install another 12 gigawatts in capacity. And we have to be able to meet the peak demand without renewables or batteries. It's very important to say this. Uh, there are points in each winter, it's typical in Germany, it's typical here, where you can get a period of up to three weeks of an anti-cyclone and um, cloudy skies or very low um, sun, so that the uh, contribution of renewables at that stage is of order 1% of its capacity, which is effectively zero in planning terms. So we're going to need to have, get this peak demand uh, um, with without renewables or batteries. And so what I've got there is a whole list of various things. And I've ended up with a mixture of onshore and offshore wind, uh, solar and nuclear. And you can see the price varies, uh, the costs vary these per megawatt hour. And the cost I get is of order 60, uh, 50 billion euros. Now that could be 60, it could be 40, but this is, it's, 50, it's of order of tens of billions, not tens of millions. Or, or tens of trillions for that matter. It's of order 50 billion pounds. And I've not given any consideration to the siting of those. And not, nor have I given any consideration as it is important in New Zealand, but not the UK on the uh, veto of uh, nuclear energy of any kind. Now, so those three uh, there add up to 123, if I've got it right, um, uh, billion pounds for uh, upgrading the electricity. I'll come back to that later on. Now, I want to take a, a, a couple of other points around this. First of all, pump storage. Uh, this is always considered as um, one of the uh, ways we consider of stirring. But here's the problem. Turlo Hill uh, is rated um, at 292 megawatts for maximum use, but the annual use is now at the moment five, 573 gigawatt hours. 
This tells me that my internet connection is unstable. Can you all hear me still? We can hear you most of the time, you, Michael. So let's continue on. It's, fine, fine. It's, we're getting okay. We're okay. okay fine. Please. Fine. Okay. Well, the point is that Turlow Hill um, produces enough electricity if all the cars uh, in, uh, in Ireland were electric. Uh, Turlow Hill, the largest storage capacity, would be able to five times in a year which impact the, the idea of running uh, on storage is uh, a really tricky uh, issue now there's another problem with battery at scale uh, which study I did with uh, Adam Brooks hospital here in Cambridge, and I've looked, St. James's Hospital in Dublin has about a thousand beds, which is roughly the same as Edinburgh's. Elon Musk put a battery outside Adelaide in Australia, which had a capacity of 128 megawatt hours uh, and uh, storage capacity and an energy just storage of uh, energy. Uh, it could run um, uh, Adelaide for something like 17 or 20 minutes. It cost 50 million dollars, uh, 50 million euros about three years ago. It would be enough to power the 30% of the wards of St. James's Hospital that are considered emergency for 24 hours on a single discharge from 80% capacity to 20% capacity. You do not run batteries from 100% to 0% because you ac accelerate their degradation. Now, that's, that's what the 40, $50 million back will be provided by diesel generators, which if compared with uh, Adam Brooks and Cambridge similar size, will cost about one third of a million euros. Um, and so if we were to run, if we were to rely on uh, electric backup for um, uh, emergencies in Dublin, the ratio of the capital cost between a battery solution and a diesel fuel solution is about 135 to one for a day. But if we had a storm which took out the transmission systems of parts of Ireland for a week, and I would remind you that recently in the Northumberland, we had storms that took electricity out for three, four and five days, then the f capital cost ratio is 1000 to one for a week, because you'd need seven of those batteries. Now, no engineer uh, or anybody giving professional advice on two systems would vote for the more expensive one when the ratio for performance is so adverse. Now, this means that the scale of the batteries will not play a role at the 1% level um, even for the UK or Irish sector in 2050. Now, I'll make a couple of short points here, uh, just a convenient place Michael, we're, we're losing sound again. Um, One um, suggestion is to switch um, off your video for the moment, and uh, that might help the voice look, what transmission. Going... Okay, yep. Fine, yeah, now it's just going to take me a minute to find it again, because uh, um, uh, how do I do? Oh, hang on, I'll just, oh, there we are. Um, stop video. Yeah, okay. See if this does better. Thank you for interrupting, because there's no point in me going on. So hydrogen, basically, the message about hydrogen is that um, it's almost, it, it, it takes an enormous amount of energy to make it, whether it's by electrolysis uh, or some form of steam reforming. And in many cases, it's much more efficient to use the original fuel that's made, uh, that's used to make hydrogen it's much more efficient to use it for the end use, whether it's powering vehicles or heating homes or whatever else. Um, so <clears throat> there's a real problem, unless you have a glut of very cheap electricity, and the only becomes very cheap in the future, uh, that that was, is likely to happen, that hydrogen would make any sense at all. There's a similar problem associated with carbon capture and storage. A colleague of mine here at Cambridge did some engineering. My, I'm just 
going to move because I have a, a, a I'm going to just move slightly so that I'm um, opposite my um, opposite my uh, router so that um, I might get better sound. Okay, uh, the, this carbon sequestration, carbon caption sequestration. The problem is this: a more efficient efficient at ex extracting the energy out of the coal and using it uh, to make electricity. If we insist on taking the CO2 out of the exhaust stack, that is a chemical separation process, which involves a decrease in entropy, and therefore you have to use more energy to get it. And the net effect of capturing the carbon dioxide from the smokestack is to reduce the overall efficiency of the, high, the, high, um, the coal-fired power station from 45% to 29%. And 29% is the efficiency of a typical coal-fired power station about 60 or 70 years ago. So there are real costs associated with CCS. Um, and that's a figure done on the basis of thermodynamics. So it's not something that's um, particularly, um, uh, it's not able to be changed dramatically. Now, here's another point about storage. This is the energy density. Uh, in megajoules per kilogram. And you can see that hydrogen looks good there compared with petrol or wood, or indeed hydro. Um, but its uh, its problem is that it's um, very light density. Um, and so you need very large volumes. I did a calculation about three years ago and assumed that if the, um, the sinusoid that I mentioned earlier about the use of electricity during the year uh, was leveled out by uh, making excess solar energy in summer and using it to make hydrogen, which you then stored and used in winter, the volume of the container needed for Ireland is a cube of size two kilometers, two kilometers long, two kilometers wide, and two kilometers high, or in practice, uh, 10 times long, 10 times wide, and 100th times uh, the height. And nobody's built anything that big. Um, and of course, if you then uh, say, well, look, I don't need it that big at standard temperature pressure, I'll pressurize the hydrogen, then you use a lot of the lot more energy to pressurize it, most much of which you do not get back when you get it. So hydrogen is, is not a general purpose uh, form of energy. It's not in, in the economy. There may be some highly specific uh, examples. Right. Now, I'm going to talk about heating and housing in the UK, uh, because there's a, a very important point here, and I'm, my thinking on this has been evolving even in the last week. Most of the winter heat in, in the UK and Ireland is for buildings, uh, both domestic and commercial. And in 2009, I was the Chief Scientific Advisor of the Department of Communities and Local Government, which had the responsibility for building controls and building regulations. And I briefed the science minister on the need to retrofit existing buildings to reduce CO2 emissions. And I suggested a pilot program. This became a 17 million pound retrofit for the future project. It's ran from, sorry, 2010. I've, uh, Jim, I'm seeing one or two errors sliding out of this, even though I looked at it carefully, I'll, I'll update it and send you another lot at the end for distribution. But the project went from 2010 to 2013 with over 100 social houses and social houses smaller than average being subject to various measures. 45 houses had a whole house retrofit. That's external and internal insulation of walls, underfloor and loft insulation, double and treble glazing, more new, new more efficient appliances, etc. everything they could do, targeting an 80% uh, emissions reduction. And the results of that experiment on 45 houses was that for an average spend of £85,000 per house, the average reduction in CO2 emissions achieved was only 60%, not the target 80%, which was met by only three out of the 45 houses. And three of the houses didn't even get a 30% reduction with that kind of spend. Now, if I scale that up to the all the houses, uh, the 2 million households in Ireland and get 100% reduction, that figure scales up to about 340 billion euros. Now, I don't think that's a realistic sum. It's far too high for the reason that the uh, experiment, the retrofit for the future experiment was a uh, 
pilot program and all the uh, projects were individually cost and designed and everything else. And there was no question of a national rollout for which uh, you would have a competitive retrofit sector with efficient supply chains, uh, learning by doing, um, a huge number of trained and skilled retrofitters. And I think this would halve the cost at least to 170 billion. The reason why it won't do it a lot more is that this is a work and this is a human resources, a fitting intensive activity. And every house needs a very closely defined bespoke solution to eliminate the last emissions. And so uh, to get a greater reduction. It's very clear um, if you don't complete uh, some of the cladding that you can set up bridges uh, through which um, energy can move more effectively, it, it can leak essentially. Now, there may be some radical new technology, some gross external spray on cladding, but um, we don't know about that yet. And even that has some difficulties about letting houses breathe. Now, the, the retrofit for the houses future was um, for, for housing only, but you can do a rough analysis on non-domestic buildings, which are larger on average and more complex, hospitals, hotels, commercial premises, and so on, and estimate that instead of 170 billion, the figure would be something like 85 billion uh, on top. And I've, I've made no explicit consideration of industrial heat um, and electric furnace because um, some electrical heat, some industrial heat, which is provided by uh, fossil fuels, gets to temperatures above that which electric furnaces can get and certain refractory materials cannot be produced uh, just with electrical heating alone. So the identified costs I've got so far come to 375 billion. That's for the housing and uh, the um, change in the electricity. Now, I want to point out here that there's a problem of double counting, because in principle, if I had enough really cheap electricity, I wouldn't mind having to um, uh, make more of it to um, uh, cover for the loss, heating losses that I've talked about. And in fact, the cost of retrofitting is about twice as expensive and roughly as um, the change of electricity. So it's clear to me that if you have a finite budget, you get further by working harder on the electricity uh, than on the retrofitting. So it seems to me low cost uh, uh, retrofitting options are, are OK, but to try and get the last 20 or 30 percent reduction on the emissions from households by increased uh, retrofitted insulation and so on is probably more expensive than just actually making more uh, low carbon electricity. And I'm working on that as a project at the moment. Now, again, I haven't mentioned electric cars or the charging infrastructure. So those are the costs. Now, W.S. Atkins, or now Atkins in this country, I talked to a director there and he said, look, if you have a one billion headline contract in the energy distribution sector, it involves an order of 1,000 years of professional engineering time and three to 4,000 years of skilled trades uh, person uh, engineering time. So if I now scale that for the 123 billion I've identified for um, electrics, we're going to need 3,600 3, electrical engineers dedicated for 30 years to complete this electrification task, compared with the fact that you have 2,800 electrical engineers in employment uh, in Ireland at the moment. And also we're going to need 13,000 skilled tradespeople for the 30 years. And those sort of numbers start to become comparable with the number of people in the health or the um, education sector. These are not small perturbations on the workforce. <clears throat> Similarly with retrofit, well, well <clears throat> sorry, I'll, I'll come back to that statement in a minute. They, these are very large variations in terms of the number of engineers. For retrofitting, uh, the range of skills uh, are needed from semi-skilled to highly professional. And compared, and they compare, sorry, with the electric and health sector, of order 50,000 people for 30 years to go from one end of Ireland to the other, improving the thermal efficiency and envelope of every building. So this is giving you a scale of the manpower requirements. And then the bill of materials. I want to just tell you something about materials, which I think is very interesting. We're going to move from a system which at the moment, our electricity system and our energy system 
in general is fuel intensive, and that is involves a lot of fuel, to a materials intensive system. And I'm going to exemplify this by a 600 megawatt combined cycle gas turbine from Siemens, which is made up of 300 tons of high performance steel. And it will run for 60 years with a midlife ref re uh, refit. Now, in order to get that 600 megawatts continuously from solar energy, I would need 360 five megawatt wind turbines at 33% efficiency, plus a huge battery system. And these um, wind turbines tend to last for only about 30 years. So in fact, I'll need two lots of them. So one 600 megawatt combined cycle gas turbine uh, needs to be replaced by 720 five megawatt wind turbines. Now, the mass of the nacelle in a five megawatt um, wind turbine is typically of order 300 tons as well. It's got heavy magnets and various other things up there. And um, it's comparable to that of the combined cycle. And the concrete for one plinth, uh, 12 tons of steel and 30, 300 tons of concrete, is equal to roughly or slightly less than the uh, foundation for each turbine on land and rather less from a turbine at sea. So you can see that the transition from gas combined cycle to wind, for example, involves far more uh, effective comparable of order of thousand. It's not a hundred, it's nearer a thousand than a hundred times as much high quality materials. And the same numbers come if you do the analysis for solar panels. And then for one particular part of uh, the electrification materials, um, if the Irish uh, vehicle fleet went electric tomorrow, the um, Natural History Museum in the UK has some scientists who did an analysis of the materials. And they think that we'd need about 15 tons of cobalt. This is just for Ireland, which is 15% of global annual production, 20 tons of lithium carbonate, which is about 6% of world production, and at least 720 tons of copper. Um, that should be K tons of copper, 1% uh, of the world's production in 2018. So these are very large amounts of material, and we would need 40 islands to be converted to net zero a year for the whole world to get there by 2050. So what you can see is a huge increase in the metal mining being required. And it's probably unsustainable in, um, in ecological terms, because the thing about, um, you want to contra concentrate, con contrast rather, open cast mining uh, with oil and gas. The oil and gas come out of the ground in one meter maximum diameter pipes, but open cast mining uh, involve square kilometers of earth being moved. That's the, um, that's the core of the analysis that I want to produce tonight. But what I want to do now is go a little further and um, discuss some of the ramifications. First of all, we're going to make almost no impact. If Ireland does it all, the UK, New Zealand, Australia uh, do it all, we're going to make almost no impact on the CO2 emissions. This slide, which I've used uh, before and used when I was in Ireland last, shows on the left the um, uh, requirements for uh, energy, for fuels in the world from coal, oil, gas, nuclear, hydro and renewables from 1965 extrapolated to 2035. And the data up to 2020 is hard data. And the beyond that, it's an extrapolation. And the extrapolation is based on the uh, diagram on the right, which shows the projection of the world population going from six to eight billion uh, over the period 2000, 2030. Um, and the brown line are, are the poor uh, and the green line, the green area, are the middle class. And the middle class here are people who live in a high rise apartment in Asia somewhere with uh, heating and lighting, uh, electricity for heating, lighting, water, and uh, communications. Now I'm gonna make one assumption that if somebody goes from the brown area that lives, is, lives in an urban slum or rural hovel and goes into the green area that is lives in a middle class apartment in a big city, if that person uses about three and a half times as much energy per person per day as the poor, then the energy diagram on the left can be fitted quantitatively. 
That is, I can account for the uh, graph not only historically since about 1980, but all the way to, through to 2050. And even the slight bend over you see at the top there of the uh, of this scale here, that bend over is the um, is in uh, you can see the greater bend over with it, which is the impact of uh, renewables, which is that thin line up the top. There's no question, by the way, of that line turning over and coming down to zero, which is what all the net zero people want to happen. It's simply just not going to happen. And here's another one which sets the whole thing in scale. This is the world consumption of energy in red brown uh, from um, 1850 through to the current day and then extrapolated linearly out to 2050. And the blue underneath it is the contribution to that total energy consumption that comes from fossil fuels. And it has been 86% for most of the uh, 20th century. Um, and it was 86% at uh, two, 20,000. It's down to 82% now, and it'll be down to about 79% in 2050. Uh, and all of this divergence of the blue and the red line is all due to the uh, uh, renewable industry, the impact of that. And you can see it's far too small to have any serious impact. Now, there's a, a third area which I think is very important. That's public acceptance. The carbon, the uh, Climate Change Committee in this country thinks the ad additional cost of this energy transition will be about 1% of GDP. My estimate is that it's more like 7% of GDP and possibly greater because the, of things that I haven't taken into account. And the figure is well in excess of 200,000 euros per household. And it will take 50 years or more to recover the investment at today's cost, although that timeline is going down as, um, as uh, energy prices rocket. Now, if the US, the UK and Europe and Australasia and Japan pay for the rest of the world to decarbonize as some of the green advocates do, and the cost per person is uh, roughly comparable, and that's a, a wild guess, it would mean that the cost to Irish homes would be about 1 million euros per household. Now, I regard that as pure fantasy. I mean, the number is not fantasy, but the idea that it would actually happen is pure fantasy. And I think that climate change adaptation is a much easier ask. And I use the Thames barrier in London as an example. And it's like, goes like this. And, um, in about uh, 1953, there was a big storm that um, took several villages out to sea 500 people died and so on. And the people worked out that if that storm had been a little bit further south, much of London would have been flooded. <clears throat> and so they said, we better put up a barrier. And the calculations would, actuarial calculations were done. When should we put up a barrier such that during its initial design life, it will save insurance claims equal to the value of the barrier uh, during that design lifetime? And the figure came out in the 1980s. So the barrier was built. And it has saved large sums of money from floods that have not happened in London. <clears throat> so in countries like New Zealand, where I come from, <clears throat> there are very large sums of money invested against earthquakes. And of course, when an earthquake comes, you have to do something about it. <clears throat> well, when it comes to sea level rise, we will actually do something when we have to. There's no point putting a five meter barrier along the waterfront in Dublin um, right now because we won't need it for several hundred years but when we do need it we'll put it up the dutch have been putting up barriers for several hundred years so we know it can be done some further issues the spend profile i have given you for those were assumed to be about constant for 30 years but much of the first decade would be needed to train the skilled workforce you know get all these extra engineers and these retrofit professionals and this means in fact that my numbers of people are probably an underestimate because we'll need more people uh, to do the work, not over 30 years, but probably over 20 years. The financing on this scale is probably beyond the scope of the private sector because the scale is more than one high speed two uh, project per year in the UK, uh, one down to Auckland to airport to uh, city structure there. And I haven't got the equivalent project in Dublin, but you'll, there'll be one in Ireland. And the other thing I think is important is that there's a, a roadmap will be essential. In the IT sector, there's something called the Inter -Tech, International Technology Roadmap for Semiconductors. And it started in the early 80s. 
And it was based on the fact that everybody assumed that um, uh, Moore's law for miniaturization would continue. And across the entire sector, all the engineers got together from all the companies around the world every two years and produced a detailed report saying what had to come out of the lab in two years time, what had to come out of the lab in four years time, what had to come out of the lab in six years time, and so on and so forth, in order to keep the IT revolution going. And it's a manifest success that the IT revolution has kept going for as long as it has, simply because everybody knew what everybody else was doing and committed to. So there's no question of a particular company uh, getting cold feet because somebody else wasn't doing it. They were all at it uh, because they had a very clear target. Now, I think that uh, retrofitting or electrifying the uh, uh, economy in Ireland is much more complicated than the technology roadmap. And it has 100 more one ways of going wrong. So um, I think there's a serious issue for a roadmap. I think it's also the case, what happens if UK or Ireland gets cold feet 10 years in? Now, there is a practical, there are some practical alternatives that I think we ought to consider. One is that the rush to 2050 will cause more trouble than it saves. I think that's pretty clear. You know, if we really committed to 2050, we would have to take huge hits in, in other expenditure, health, education, welfare, and so on. Now, my problem is that computed projections are overestimate and over pessimistic. In climate terms, the RCP 8.5 is, um, is um, far worse in terms of a projection of uh, CO2 emissions. And the population for RPC keeps growing exponentially, whereas we know it's going to peak in about 2050 or 60. China's population is going to peak within 10 years. And in COVID terms and in the foot and mouth rate in 2002, all of these models have got things far worse than are needed. And so I think we have to scale back our realistic expectations of what cl the climate change costs will actually be in order to do a proper cost benefit analysis. So my personal view at this stage is that net zero is an unattainable pipe dream without major national commitment, a, can, a command economy and low standards of living. No democratic basis debate has been, is, has been had on the data. And I think we should repeal the net zero act in the UK and replace it with a more realistic target. Now, here's my final point here. And that is the absence of the academies and the professional bodies on this particular debate is unconscionable. I think it's actually bordering on, tre uh, on sedition because within these major academies, there are people who know the scale of these problems, but they're not heard and they're not, uh, their views are not promulgated. And if we suddenly get cold feet in 10 years time when the enormity of what we've committed to realize, uh, reaches us and we find out that China's turned off all lithium supplies uh, and neodymium supplies to the world, there'll be a huge public outroar. And if there's any unrest, that will be said, it will be claimed that the people who drove this project were guilty of sedition, no less. So there you are, the final bill, 123 billion for electrification, 255 for retrofitting. We don't need both a zero carbon electricity and zero emissions home. So there's a bit of double counting. The electrification is the cheaper option other than the low cost basic measures. And for that, I'll stop.